I'll start two minutes early. Is that okay? We've actually got a full group, so can everybody hear me okay? Or do I need to talk louder, quieter? Is it all okay? Um, by show of hands, how many of you are technical or would classify yourselves as technical? Mm, okay. So, <laughs> I'll adjust and adapt. So, if you guys have questions, just raise your hand. I'll try and repeat the question as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to do an introduction. I know the session's called an introduction to IOTSP. We've been going through a number of various name changes within the organization as well. And this is actually a product that's still in incubation at Cisco. Um, you won't actually see it anywhere out there in the world of solutions or anything like that. It's not a shipping product yet. So you're getting a sneak peek into something that's going to be coming out in April time frame. And I can do this in two ways. I can kill you with PowerPoint or I can walk you through the UI and everything like that. But I do want to do a bit of PowerPoint. So what do you guys want? PowerPoint? Oh, interesting. Okay, and then demo. Okay, so, okay. The demo guys come to me afterwards, no. <laughs> okay. Um, what is IoT DC? It actually stands for IoT Data Connect. It's actually an umbrella name for a couple of products within the IoT Data Connect family. It's something I've been trying to get off the ground for about 18 months now inside Cisco, and we're in April, we'll actually have availability, so general availability. We have got customers using it currently but it's really proof of concept kind of customers and we're actually doing it slightly differently compared to what we usually do at Cisco. We're actually working with a customer and saying, hey, what do you really want? What do you need? And we're sort of building that up as we go along. The whole premise behind IoT Data Connect and why we actually started it off was to be able to connect devices to the cloud at mass scale. How many of you deploy routers or switches? Is it easy? Logistics-wise, configuration-wise, configuring your head end, everything like that. <laughs> At least I got one laugh, right? What if I told you you could just take a Cisco gateway, order it on CCW, send it out to the customer site, let a non-technical person plug it in, and claim it in the cloud, and it will come up magically? Would you believe me? No? The guys that have done this before say no. Okay, that's what I've built. You know, we've got a team of engineers and that's exactly what we've been doing. Now we've gone a layer further and said, well, it's cool to have a gateway there. Everybody heard about IOX? Hopefully. Okay, the concept of IOX on Cisco industrial routers, uh, the 809, the 829, even like the IE4K, the industrial ethernet switches, we actually have a spare core. So those are Intel-based platforms, the 809 and the 829, and there's actually a spare core. And we use that core to run another operating system. The hypervisor actually runs iOS on one virtual machine, and then it runs another distribution of Linux on the other one. And that allows us to actually deploy applications down. What do we do with those applications? We connect them to machines. And we try and get data out of those machines to transmit to the cloud so that we can give it to IBM or Microsoft to do analytics. Okay, and that's actually pretty difficult to do. And what we've tried to do is simplify that completely. Okay, so this is the PowerPoint part of it. What are some of the customer challenges we see? And I'm sure anybody that actually sort of does Cisco stuff knows this by, off by heart. So how do I connect my things? How do I actually get these things plugged in? How do I get them connected reliably? If they speak some weird random protocol that I've never heard of, how do I actually start talking to those things? How do I understand what they're doing? How do I actually know when I've got this thing connected, what's relevant to me? How do I actually assign policies, everything like that, to these data sets that I'm learning and transmitting that off to the right location? So if I have a machine learning partner that wants to do machine learning on my car or anything like that, how do I actually get the data routed to him and him only? And if I decide he's awful and I no longer want to use him, how do I change my providers? You know, how do I send data to a different place? And how do I use this data to actually change my business? I think I was talking about that in one of the um, panel sessions the other day. It's, it's no longer at Cisco. We don't see it as selling hardware. We don't see it as selling software, anything like that. We go there now and we really try and get a business outcome. We try and solve a problem. 
My problem is not that I want to deploy a Cisco switch. My problem is that I actually want to, I want to save 1,500 euro every time I send a technician out. Why not just ship it out, let the mailman plug it in, and the thing comes up, you know? So those, those are the problems we're trying to solve. What does it look like? You'll hear me talk about connecting. So connecting to things. Transportation. How do we actually securely transport data to the cloud? Okay, Because anybody can transport it, but if you're sending it over HTTP, then it's not really good, right? Then how do we enable consumption of the data? But then the big thing is how do I actually manage all of this complexity that I've actually introduced? Okay, So how do I know what I'm connecting to? How do I know how I'm transporting the data into the backhaul? How do I actually consume that? So at each of these phases within the solution, we've gone and solved those individual challenges. So down here, you know, there's a southbound interface. So we've got a software stack that actually goes and talks various protocols to all these different machine types, all these devices that actually come and connect to what we call a traditional network, right? Now, if we're in a big factory or anything like that, more, more than likely they're running a completely separate network as well. Some of these machines don't even talk TCP IP. How do we actually start interpreting those protocols? So like on an 829 or an 809, there's actually a serial port at the back, right? And you can reconfigure that serial port to interpret protocols. So you can plug it into a CAN bus, as an example. You can get the box to actually understand Modbus TCP or even Modbus RTU. How many of you guys have heard of those? See? <laughs> It's like this crazy world that Cisco sort of stepped into, and you've got all these old school operational technologies, and we're trying to come in and say, hey, there's actually a better way to do this, and we can get data for you out of these things, and we can start helping you transform your business. Okay? Transportation. One of the big things we do, and I'll walk you guys through this, and I'll actually show you this as well. We securely transport all the data from the machines up into the cloud. Remember that, I mean, I work with a customer that builds parts for Boeing, okay? Can you imagine if some crazy organization gets hold of the details on that and they can start compromising elements of that? Or even worse, their competitor gets hold of the data as to how they're actually building components. And they can then learn from them and maybe enhance on their process and thereby make more money, right? So how do we actually make sure and make sure that these guys feel comfortable about it? Fog services. That's the IOX element. There's a whole bunch of intelligence we can actually run down at the edge. You know, sometimes we've got so much processing that needs to take place at the local site that we don't want to send it all to the cloud. We, we might want to look locally and say, oh, the temperature is actually rising pretty dramatically on this machine. I need to quickly go and change something, turn on a fan, maybe shut the engine down, anything like that. If I had to wait for all that data to go up to the cloud, have some little logic engine in the cloud, process that, and then send it back down, it would be really challenging because the latency going up and coming back down and the processing and everything like that, by the time you actually get the decision back down, the machine might have blown up. <laughs> okay. So being able to do that at the edge in near real time, so taking these streams in, looking at the real data and saying, oh, there's a catastrophic failure that's going to happen. Let's intervene quickly. That's super powerful for these guys. But then the other thing is they want to know in general, how are these machines functioning? How are they operating? Overall efficiency, what, how efficient are they? Why do I have one plant that's in Singapore and another one that's in Berlin? And the Berlin branch is completely efficient, but the one in Singapore is not. They're using the same machines, same work schedules, everything like that. What is different? And through the cloud, you can actually start figuring that out. The old school way was to actually take this data, put it into a, a USB drive, or even worse, try and transport it up via your satellite links and things like that to try and get that data into one central location. Okay. Everybody interested in cloud? Yes. Everything's going to the cloud. It's like, you know, in IT, we have these cycles. Everything was distributed, then it went central, and now it's going distributed again, and with all these different flavors of it. Okay. So in the cloud, what cloud gives us is scalability. A lot of the customers I talk to, they, they get to like 8,000 gateways that they connect. And then at 8,001, the world falls apart for them. 
and we handle all that scaling for these guys. So you can scale to, on a cluster that I'm spinning up, I can scale up to 8.5 million gateways. You know, and then if I run out of, if I go to 8.5 million and one, I just spin up another cluster. You know, and I can scale it as much as I want to infinity, which is great. Because all I have to do is pay for some infrastructure services and everything else, but my whole software stack is just dynamically scaling. And then you see those big boys up there. AWS, they've got analytics. Google's got analytics. Microsoft Azure's got analytics. G Predix is analytics. Um, IBM has got analytics. Those guys want the data. But they're extremely weak in trying to get the data to them because they have to work with a normal traditional Cisco guy and the IT departments and all this complexity and they have to build out all the infrastructure and that's just one thing that they don't specialize in at all. It's like we at Cisco, we don't go do machine learning. You know, We're just not the experts in that at all. So we say, hey, we'll deliver the data for you, deliver it securely, reliably, everything like that and you guys can consume it. Okay. This is the stack. If anybody that likes fluffy architecture slides. Okay. If you want to see the true architecture, I can show you the architecture as well. It's pretty standard. Um, we have things, the hardware devices running hypervisors, software, everything like that, centrally managed from the cloud with all the southbound connectors, all those protocols that we're interpreting the whole time, looking at those various options, you know, like. There's so many of these, you know, there's companies that actually make money just out of connecting to machines. It's like 500 different protocol types, but then every time you have, you think you understand the protocol, somebody in, goes and installs and interprets the protocol completely differently. Okay, so then you have to go relearn and change everything again. Got two parts, we got the edge and fog fabric. So all the local processing, everything like that, being able to do the local logic, taking data in, defining rules, um, every, everybody know that if, if this, then that, there's an application, if this, then that, exactly that. You know, being able to say, if the temperature goes above X degrees, do the following. If the RPM goes this and the temperature does this, do the following. Extremely simple logic. And where we are right now in the time with IoT, that covers like 80% of the use cases in any case. It's the big boys, the mines, the auto manufacturers, everything like that. They're really interested in the analytics at the top to drive efficiencies. But the normal small mom and pop shops that are just building a couple of parts for F-16 fighter jets, they're just interested in making sure that the parts are coming out, the machines are running efficiently, they're on, they're off. And then the other key thing is gaining remote access. Okay. So we can enable a whole bunch of stuff. Anomaly detection, we can do data transformation. Maybe a machine talks one format and you actually want to transform that into something else. How many of you have I lost so far? No? Can I carry on going? If I need to go back and re-explain, I'll re-explain. I've got like a whole week. I'll be here until next week, Friday. So it's okay. Network management, because to be fair, the target audience for this, what's a big manufacturer? Let's say like a BMW, right? A BMW doesn't really want to go and build out a network management team that can manage 8,000 sites and however many routers and switches and everything like that. It's just a massive complexity for them. And it's not their core expertise, right? They build really nice cars. That's what they do. And northbound enterprise connectors. Everybody wants a different application, right? So somebody might want to send the data to SAP, somebody might want to send the data to Salesforce, who knows? So what we start doing, and I'll show you this as well when I start going through the UI, I can send it to multiple sources. You know, I can send it off to IBM, and you can build your dashboard on IBM. I've got some rudimentary stuff I can do as well. I've got a Cisco product that can take data, interpret it, apply logic, everything like that as well. But in general, we try and do some pre-integration with other clusters and different services so we can get intelligence out of the data. Okay? Make sense? Yes. <laughs> okay. Remember the connect, transport, consume, and manage? These are all the stacks. These are the components. You know, So from a connect, device protocol normalization, being able to understand these machines. Data ingestion at scale. You know. It's actually pretty difficult. Everybody heard about something called MQTT? 
Okay, a few of you. That's just the normal publishing, subscribing technology. You take a message, you send it to a publisher, while well, you actually publish it, and you have subscribers that can listen to those topics. Um, anybody know multicast? Yeah, so I think I've covered like 100% of the audience now, Mike. So just being able to listen to a topic, and you only subscribe to the topics you're interested in, right? So being able to handle all of that within the structures too. Secure multi-tenant environments. To be fair, if you're in a cloud space, it doesn't make sense to actually go spin up a new cloud instance for every customer, right? So you have to go and build this in a way that you can completely isolate one customer from the other, and you can completely isolate one customer's data set from another customer's data set. So you've got no cross-hacking or anything like that. Policy-based routing. One of the big things we see in the old traditional world, there was a way where everybody wanted you to be locked in. And that's part of the reason why you have all these crazy protocols out in the industry. If I'm using, I don't know, make up a protocol, anything. Let's say if I'm using Modbus, I'm tied into whoever the Modbus guys are, you know? And what we're trying to do is say, hey, we're gonna free you from that. We'll handle all the connectors. If you have one machine that talks Modbus, one that talks Profibus, another one that talks Canbus, we'll present the data for you and you can do with the data what you like. So, you know, freeing up the data, that's extremely valuable for the customer too. APIs, you guys are in the DevNet zone, and this is why we're showing it here. We're trying to target developers. You know, we need developers to sit on top of the platform, build the UIs, build analytics engines, take the data, transform the data, give it off to other customers as well. There's a whole marketplace to be had over here. You know, both on the connectivity side, on the consumption side, and then obviously we manage everything. Cam. What's the value of this? I can actually take one data stream from a machine, bump it in to my data pipeline. It's just a normal Kafka message bus. Anybody heard about Kafka? Yep, a few. So it's a normal Kafka message bus. I take the data, I put it into this device connector that actually transforms it, says, hey, this is Modbus, I'm going to take this, I'm going to pass it up into the cloud in JSON format. Once it's in JSON format, I can start doing stuff. So I can look at that stream of data that's coming to me the whole time, and maybe I want to go and apply a different data model to it. Maybe I want to transform it. You know, I want to take it, say, JSON, okay, go and convert it, make it XML. So another XML application can actually interpret that data too and apply rules to it. I might want to say that, hey, I'm getting all these different readings. I want to send the temperature readings to this part of the network. I want to send all the humidity readings to this location. Maybe I want to go and take barometric pressure outside as well and say, oh, there's a storm coming. You know, I can start doing things like this. And then I can expose all of that data using APIs. So you can go securely authenticate and say, hey, give me a token and I want access to the following data. Who do you think controls access to that data, though? The customer. The customer is the guy that always keeps the keys. He will say, yes, I want Billy Bob over there to actually have access to my data. Before that, Billy Bob will have no access. If he gets tired of Billy Bob because Billy Bob's not performing anymore, he can go and disable his access. Okay. One of the other big things I don't show on the slide is remote access. You wouldn't believe it. Most of the customers we talk to, um, they have a little field technician. He's got a Windows 95 laptop. It's got a dial-up modem. And they actually have just remote desktop sharing on the laptop. You know, if you want to get into the machine, you do remote desktop sharing down to the laptop. You plug the laptop into this machine, and then you can do controls and everything like that. So what we provide from the cloud platform itself is secure VPN. Have you guys heard of AnyConnect? Cisco AnyConnect? Yeah. So we actually run virtual ASAs in the core. And as a service, a customer can just say, hey, I want access to my remote estate. All these machines you guys have been connecting for me, I want remote access to that. And it's just another checkbox. Grant the user remote access. He can VPN in, connect via the cloud platform. He doesn't have to invest in all the VPN head-end infrastructure, anything like that. And he comes back over the secure tunnels that we've built as well. Okay. This is some of the stuff. Um, 
gateway application and network management. So zero touch deployment. It truly is zero touch deployment. You know, at Cisco, I've been at Cisco for 12 years now. And yes, we always talk about zero touch deployment, but the reality on zero touch deployment is I have to go build a whole bunch of server infrastructure and management infrastructure, everything like that. And then what I can do is I can actually get my gateways to deploy themselves. We're saying straight out of the box, this is zero touch, you know? Well, the only touch you have to do is physically mount it, <laughs> okay? But you don't have to touch CLI. We actually disable CLI access completely on the box. So as a partner, as a customer, they would never get access to it because all the tools exist in the cloud to be able to see what's the state of that network interface, what's the state of the cellular network, what's the location for the gateway, what's the noise ratio on Wi-Fi, on cellular, everything like that. All the normal stuff I would want to see as a network engineer, I can actually see just from the web. Okay. So I can go in, I've got multiple organizations. I might want to say, hey, I'm going to split my little service provider land that I've created into multiple organizations because I actually want to go resell this, right? So maybe if I buy a service provider account from Cisco, I can go add a whole bunch of my own customers and restrict them completely. So when a customer logs in, all he sees is his little organization with the gateways that you've provisioned for him. So all of a sudden, you can charge him your normal management fee, but we do all the management for you. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay. <laughs> Security, massive, massive problem. You know, with the technologies that are actually out there, um, security is becoming a big thing. So being able to control everything over VPN, running everything on TLS, those are challenges that people face. There's Krishna, he's my geek. He's the propeller head in the back end. You know that. So you want technical questions, you can go ask him. Okay. Secure remote access, like I just said, being able to give these guys secure remote access all the way down to the machine behind the Cisco gateway itself. And then another thing that we're playing with, a lot of times you actually want to send down a different plan down to a machine. Maybe you're cutting in a certain way or something like that, and you want to change that. You know, Currently, it's actually pretty antiquated. They actually have to go down to the machine, maybe with a USB thumb drive or something like that, plug it in, upload the new file, and then authorize that file. What we provide is the ability to do that remotely from the cloud, again, as well. Okay, so taking that touching the machine story out of it. How does it work? You're probably thinking, he's lying. It doesn't work that way. Okay, the reality is you actually get the gateway. What, the way that we'll have it is you'll order it on CCW. You'll have a little drop-down option that says cloud managed. Once you click that, we'll automatically ship it with the correct iOS versions. We'll make sure iOS is installed. We'll make sure all the cartridges are installed if you're running normal PaaS applications, or we put in a root FS if we're running a Docker-style application. And we also put in like a little dial home script so that when you plug it in and you power it on, it will actually start dialing home. So every five minutes, it's going to go over HTTPS and dial home to a cloud head end that we've defined. And it's going to say, hey, I'm here. And if you haven't claimed it or nobody's claimed it, we're just going to ignore it. So we'll just ignore the request. Okay. So as a field technician, what you're going to need is an iPhone application. I'm hoping to have an Android application too. How many of you guys use iPhones? See, that's so sad. Android? There we go. Windows Phone. Yay! <laughs> OK. So I, I won't support Windows Phone, though. But you can do it via the web app. OK. <laughs> so simply log into the application. And every single Cisco gateway actually has a serial number on the bottom. It's a barcode. OK. I actually use a Windows Phone, too. So don't feel bad. I actually really like Windows Phone OS. It's got a little barcode at the bottom. And I can scan that. And it will provision. So it will tell the cloud, hey, somebody actually has this gateway now, and they're scanning it. We'll do a reference check in the back end. Are you authorized to actually be scanning that serial number? And then we'll securely admit you to the network. Okay. So he'll go connect that up. And then once he's actually done it and claimed it, he can claim it either via the app or via the web portal, which is what I'll show you guys. Okay. So he's just going to go scan it, register power it up. As soon as he finishes powering it up, it dials home. 
it's now authorized. So previously, if he had powered it up before he did the claim, the gateway would have been declined the whole time. Now he powers it up. And once it boots up, we do a couple of stuff on the cellular network, make sure it's up, decide which interface we're going to use, everything like that. We can do full NAT traversal as well. So even if you put it in a normal private subnet, it will still be able to get to the internet and pull down its configuration. And that's the trick. It actually pulls down a configuration that we've predefined for the organization. All that config does is say, hey, your tunnel destination address is the following, which is actually a CSR that we define. We go spin up dynamically in the cloud if there's not already one running. We'll go spin it up and say, hey, establish a tunnel to this. The technology we use in the back end, anybody heard of Flex VPN? Yes. Normal Cisco Flex VPN. We securely go and establish that tunnel and we run crypto, IPsec. Because these boxes actually have a hardware crypto chip, right? So we can actually do acceleration on that. It's a lot quicker than doing everything in the software layer. Okay. So once that's done, it's completed. You know, from a provisioning point of view, what we're actually doing on provisioning is we're saying, hey, your CSR is assigned to this. For application management, you're going to be assigned to this resource. For network management, you're going to be assigned to this resource. So we can dynamically load balance in the back end to make sure there's no overlaps, no challenges, anything like that. And you can scale horizontally to an infinite amount if you really wanted to. Please bring me an infinite amount of gateways. I'll be a very happy man. OK. The next thing is I push the fog application down. That application is what I spoke about earlier, right? It's going to go talk to these machines and interpret the data from the machine so it can transmit it up to the cloud. Okay. So deploy that. It connects to all the sensors and starts gathering the data. The way that I'll show it over here, I've got a little Raspberry Pi. And if you guys go do the lab later with Krishna. So he's got a lab today at 2 o'clock over here at W4 and then at 5 o'clock at W3. So if you guys want to get hands on, you can go and sit over there and you'll spend some time with you and help you through the platform itself as well. Okay. So the application will start interpreting data and deliver it up to the cloud. Once it's in the cloud, we can start doing all the other funky things that I was talking about. Okay. Believe me or not? Yes. So the question is, the SIM card's only on the gateway. Yes. So the 809s and the 829s actually come with SIM cards. Well, not with SIM cards, with SIM card slots. So you'd go and de decide on your, your carrier that you want to use. Obviously, we'd prefer if you were engaged with Jasper, because it makes it a lot easier. Because in the back end, what I can do then with Jasper Control Center for troubleshooting, I can look at the cellular network. The PIN code? Yeah, you can. You can actually. So can you in enter the PIN code or the SIM card somewhere? Yes, on CLI. You can actually add that in. Well, I will handle that for you. OK, so from the cloud, we actually handle that. To be fair, though, most SIM cards, yes. Well, we can do it with pre-provisioning. You, you still do get semi-access to the network, even without the, pin card being, without the pin code being there. One of the big things, though, is most IoT-type SIM cards don't have pin codes associated to them. So if you look at like a Jasper SIM card for IoT, there won't actually be a pin code associated to it. Okay. There was another question. Yes. Yep. See, you're taking my thunder away. <laughs> the, the question is, so when we're pushing these applications down to the device, that's IOX, right? So surely the service in the back end should be something called Fog Director. And no. We do currently use Fog Director. To be fair, um, what we've actually gone and done is we've actually turned Fog Director into a cloud service. Uh, that allows us to scale it, everything like that. And the other reason we don't usually mention that we're using Fog Director is the reality is I don't really need to have a Fog Director, right? I can still use IOX client and talk directly as well. So as a backup, I can always say, oh, maybe I've got an issue. Yeah, maybe we run into a crazy security bug, which never happens at Cisco, right? And we have to shut down our Fog Director instances. <laughs> and then I can talk directly to the gateway as well. OK. So there's a whole bunch of services in the back end. Like from a network management point of view, we use Field Network Director, 
You guys must have heard about Field Network Direct. If you go to the IoT space over there, you'll see everything about Field Network Direct and everything else. And we use Fog Director for the ecosystem. You'll actually see some of the UI stuff. We've actually used the Fog Director UI elements to be able to get the same logical flow if you're used to Fog Director. Okay. So, what does it look like? I don't know which instance I'm logging into, but I will log in. Ah, it's actually Krishna's lab, so I'm not going to log in there. No, let's do something different. Let's disconnect from there. Um, Okay, so everybody saw me log in. What typically happens when we log in, you're just going to land up at whatever dashboard you're in. Because I'm a super admin on the system, I get access to a whole bunch of stuff that a normal user wouldn't get access to. <laughs> okay, So I can go into multiple organizations and everything like that. It's a super simple intuitive UI. That's what we're aiming for. Remember, our target audience is not the technical network geek. Our target audience is actually the guy that owns the machine. The guy that just wants to say, hey, my gateway's up, my machine's up, and I can see data coming from it. Okay. So what I get automatically when I log in, I can see all my gateways. I can see the status on those. I can see which ones are new, which ones are configured. I can see my applications as well. And what I can do is if I click on there, I can get a map view as well. Okay. So this is actually one of our Cisco buildings that we work in, and all the gateways are provisioned there. What I can get as well is, you know, some details on the gateway. It's like, oh, okay, this is actually a model IR809, and it's running iOS 15.62T. It's a pre-release iOS. Okay, because we actually ran into bugs on iOS. Can you imagine that? Okay. So you get a decent overview of that. I can cycle between those as well. Look at all the different devices as well. Okay. From a gateway management point of view, this is the view. So all of a sudden, I can start looking at these gateways. I can see which gateways are live, which ones are actually in a new state, which are currently configuring. If I go and claim a gateway, it will go from a new state to a configuring state and then to a healthy state. Maybe somebody goes and unplugs it and it goes down. And then I need a down icon as well. Okay. So what's the process to claim a gateway? I go in, yeah. I can either scan the serial number on the gateway with the iPhone app, or I can come and do it manually. Okay. So I'm going to claim the following gateway. What I do want to do, though, is my gateway typically needs Ethernet access, maybe. Or maybe if it's an 829, it's actually got a Wi-Fi hotspot in it, too. So maybe I want to enable that, right? So if I go into this. I can go and define a configuration. Okay, so I want to go and create a new config and call it Live 2017. I want to enable or disable the LAN ports themselves. So I might not even need LAN ports, right? I might not need those Ethernet ports. If I've got a machine that's connected over the serial port, my application is going to know that and will enable the serial port for you. And it means I'll never have to connect it to the local network because all I use is cellular backhaul. I can go and enable the SSID on the gateway too. I can use a predefined scrambled SSID that we generate for you. Or if wanted, I can go and create my own one as well. So you can go and create your own SSID with your pre-shared key and everything like that. Okay. So I'm just going to use whatever LAN only. Do you have a concept of custom fields? Remember at the beginning I was talking about data routing, where I wanted to send it. Maybe what I want to do is I want to say, hey, all the traffic from site A and machine type, I don't know, Mazak. I want to send to Microsoft Azure. Maybe at site A, but machine type Makino, I want to send off to Google ML Learning because I want to do a comparison. 
I would actually use the custom fields to define that. You know, I would say, oh, these are all the Makinos, these are all the Mazaks, and when I do my data routing on the policies, I can send them to different destinations. Okay. The other thing that I want to do is define my address so that it actually shows up on the map correctly. If I use the iPhone application, what we do is we use your local iPhone location and we'll put that into the address. But then you're going to say, what if I put this into a truck and it's driving around? Then it's always going to be at the wrong location, right? So these gateways have GPS in them as well. So one of the things we're doing now is we're actually saying, okay, let's actually go interrogate the GPS at a regular interval so we can update the map and say where it really is. And one of the customers we're working with actively is saying, hey, I actually want a history of where it went as well. Okay? But what happens if I have a gateway that should not be in a truck? <laughs> should it be moving? No. So there's a couple of things we can do. With Jasper integration, we can actually go put in a violation. So we can actually go do a geofence using the cellular network. And we can say if the SIM card moves, disable the SIM card. Or keep the SIM card enabled, but only allow texting. Okay, so we can actually send SMSs and we can get replies and everything like that as well. Because under the hood on the gateway, has anybody heard of Embedded Event Manager? Nobody. Somebody. It's kind of sad because I think as Cisco we sort of dropped the ball a bit. Because if you go into a Cisco router on CLI, there's something called Embedded Event Manager. And you can write essentially basic logic and make the box do just about anything. We actually use it to reboot it, upgrade software, downgrade software, but you could also go and use it to interpret messages. So if I wanted to do something on the box, I could actually send it a secure SMS, receive that SMS, and then set up a whole bunch of rules on the gateway to do other things. Shut down interfaces, bring them back up, do tests, everything like that. Okay. So I click claim. Oh. So it's already claimed. That's no good, right? So that's another thing. Um, there we go. So now it's claiming. One of the big questions we always get is, well, what if my gateway's already been claimed? There you just saw what would happen. We only allow that gateway to exist once in the system. We obviously, when you claim at the serial number, we go and do some checking in the back end to make sure that you are the rightful owner of that gateway as well. So this gateway has already come up, and it's provisioned. Okay, so one of the cool things that I can do, so let's have a look at this gateway. This gateway's been up for a while. This is back in San Jose. I might have assets behind it. So typically, the way that we deploy it, we plug in Raspberry Pis for demos, and we have a little sense hat sensor on it. The reason we use sense hat sensors is because they're super unreliable. Okay, <laughs> so they generate data the whole time. Okay, so we take that, and this, I can go and discover the assets that are directly plugged into the gateway. Because a lot of times, these technicians don't know anything, right? But from the cloud, I can go and discover what's there. I can claim that, I can add it as a new asset, give it a description, everything like that as well. Now, this is the question that you had. Application lifecycle management. Another super important thing. To be able to go and talk to these machines with all these various protocols, we need to send applications down. So this is how we do it. It's actually really easy. You know, you can go and say, hey, manage the application. I can upload a new version. I can see which gateways have the applications running already. I can see their IP addresses. You remember when you deploy an application that fires up a Linux container on iOX, and that will have its own IP address. And to install it, I simply do that and click Install. And it will go away and start deploying that application down. So obviously, in the back end, we're doing verification. Is this running? Everything like that. Does it have the right cartridges? If this gateway doesn't have the right cartridges, it will actually fail. So we'll actually see that it will show failed over there. So this is going over the WAN now, so it's going to take a bit of time to actually get there. And then we have data delivery. So all that application is doing, it's going to go talk to my little SenseAd sensor and get data and transmit it to the cloud. And then my next step is routing it to a broker. Okay? So on this cluster, I actually route some data to Microsoft Azure. And my data consumer on there is actually CAM. Okay? So I actually use a Microsoft Azure MQP connector, and I send it out, and then I have another CAM instance running on top of that. Okay? 
I have, might have an internal broker, and for that, I'll be using Freeboard. So I'll just use Freeboard and open source UI to actually interpret the data. Okay. So if I go in and I actually log into Cam, Cam is running in the cloud, actually. It's still running on Cisco InterCloud, but we won't tell anyone. This is actually one of the gateways. This is in San Jose. And it actually has a sense at center and see how much noise it's generating. Okay, so this has been running. And we're essentially taking this data now from the gateway all the way to the cloud. And then we've made that data available to consume and visualize. Within CAM, I can go and run some additional rule sets and everything like that. Or I might want to use a different provider, right? So you guys, anybody that was here earlier, you would have seen me on Freeboard. And this is a Freeboard instance that we run. And this is actually a little demo Freeboard implementation. And it's taking that same data that you guys were just seeing in CAM, and it's just representing it differently. So that I can show, hey, I can actually take the same data set and consume it on different platforms. And there we go. So now you can actually see that data is live coming directly out of the box. Okay, so super simple. I mean, literally to go and deploy a gateway takes you like 15 minutes. You've got a bit of work to do on the application front and everything like that. But this is the premise, being able to take a gateway out of the box from the factory, plugging it in and getting it to register to the cloud and securely delivering data to whichever providers you choose. Okay, questions? Mm -hmm. Yep. So the question is, what if I have to manage like a thousand gateways? We actually have a mechanism to do bulk import. So you can do a bulk import. You can do bulk software upgrades. You can do bulk application deployments, everything like that. So we got a concept as well where for you, you might not want to go and say, these are a thousand serial numbers, right? I just want to give you an invoice number. So you take the invoice, we give you an invoice number, you take the invoice number, you type in the invoice number, and you claim it, and we do all the heavy lifting for you in the back end. Okay. Is there, is there a concept of actually grouping the gateways? The way that we do it is with the custom fields. So if you go and you search on a custom field of gateway type X, it will only show gateway type X for you. So that's how we do our grouping. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Yes. I can't hear you. I think I got it. Does it exist with existing infrastructure? So currently, the gateway deployments are actually greenfield. Okay. I am working with customers on brownfield deployments as well. <coughs> As for working with in current deployed infrastructure, sure. You know, the dial home actually uses HTTPS, so that should be able to traverse a proxy. The big challenge we have is our IPsec sessions, <coughs> we'd need TCP and UDP opened up for that, just to the head end itself so that you can run crypto IPsec. But typically, if we work with the IT departments, we get that opened up, and as long as they can vet it, then they're pretty happy with it. Okay. Cool. That's my story. If you guys have any questions, um, you can come here, or you can go to Krishna's session later as well. So he'll be doing more of a hands-on. So what you'll do is you'll actually go and claim your own gateway, deploy your own application. If you have the time, write your own application and push it down to the gateway as well and just play with it and see how easy it is to actually get it running. Okay? Thank you.